Hello everyone, welcome back to Elevate in Spirit. Today I will share with you another insightful episode of Financial Stewardship. I'm thrilled to continue our journey together as we delve deeper into the principles of managing our finances in alignment with God's Word. If you've been following along since episode 1, you're in for a treat today as we wrap up our first week with a powerful discussion. But before we dive in, remember, if you're interested in exploring these concepts further, we have some resources available. More on that later. Now, let's dive into it. Now, let me share a personal testimony with you. You see, I've been in ministry for over five decades, and I've experienced my fair share of financial struggles. Despite coming from a comfortable background, I found myself in dire straits early on in my ministry. I harbored misconceptions about God's provision, expecting supernatural interventions without aligning my actions with His principles. For the first two decades or so, it was a constant battle. I vividly recall vendors turning me over to collection agencies, questioning my integrity as a Christian. But amidst the trials, a shift occurred. I realized God's calling for a broader ministry, one that necessitated financial stability. And so, armed with faith and determination, I immersed myself in over 200 scriptures on prosperity. I remember what God said in Romans 10:17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. This verse explains how important it is to hear the word about Christ in order to grow in faith. In this way, it shows that hearing the word and growing in faith are connected. Basically, it says that faith isn't something you're born with. It's something you learn and grow by hearing about Christ's instruction and truths. People are moved to believe and trust in Christ more deeply when they hear and interact with His word, whether it's through preaching, reading the Bible, or some other method. In other words, this verse expresses how important it is to actively seek out and accept God's word as a way to increase your faith in Christ. Day in and day out, I meditated on these scriptures, allowing faith to take root in my heart. And you know what? Miraculously, my circumstances began to change. Today, I stand before you as a testament to God's faithfulness. Our ministry has flourished, acquiring over $130 million in assets debt-free and embarking on ambitious expansion plans. However, despite these blessings, I have encountered a prevalent misconception within the body of Christ. Some believe that prosperity is antithetical to spiritual growth, that ministers shouldn't thrive financially. Friends, let me dispel this notion once and for all. Financial prosperity isn't a sign of greed or selfishness. Rather, it's a tool for advancing God's kingdom. I implore each one of you to examine your beliefs about prosperity. Are you hindered by stinking thinking as I once was? Do you struggle to reconcile faith with financial stability? If so, it's time for a paradigm shift. God desires abundance for His children, not scarcity. Whether you dream of entrepreneurship, missions, or simply financial security, know that it's within your reach. Let me share with you a parable from Mark 10:17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In this scripture, we witness a significant encounter between Jesus and a man seeking guidance on how to attain eternal life. The man goes straight to Jesus, running to him and kneeling in front of him in respect. He calls him good teacher. His deep spiritual search for the way to salvation and eternal happiness is shown by his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This moment catches the essence of how everyone is looking for meaning and purpose in life beyond this world. As a spiritual leader and authority, Jesus plays a central part in this story. It gives seekers a chance to talk about the basic truths of faith and forgiveness. But Jesus looks on the heart and not just the outward appearance, that's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
In this scripture captures a deep truth about how God sees things compared to how we see them. In this case, the prophet Samuel is in charge of naming the next king of Israel. When he sees Eliab, Jesse's oldest son, he thinks that he must be the chosen one because of how good-looking and tall he is. But God tells Samuel not to judge people by how they look, stressing that he judges people by the state of their hearts, not by how they look. This verse stresses how important it is to have inner qualities like honesty, loyalty, and following God's will. It shows that a person's true worth comes from their character and goals, not from how they look or what they've done in the world. Even though Jesus is good and might be one of the world's best examples of love, forgiveness, and selflessness, they don't want to make him God. But in Acts 4.12, Jesus says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This Bible verse says in a few words a basic Christian belief about forgiveness. It basically says that Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved, which means being freed from sin and its effects and going to live forever. The only way for everyone to be saved is through Jesus, who is unique and available to everyone. It says that no other name, person, or God in heaven can save people. Because of this, Christians are told to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the only way to be saved and have a relationship with God for all time. And Jesus said of himself in John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In this verse, Jesus makes it clear that he is the only way to reach God the Father. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he makes it clear that he is the only one who can connect people to God. He says that the only way to be saved and talk to the Father is through him. This sentence emphasizes how important Jesus Christ is to the Christian faith by talking about his divinity, his role as the embodiment of truth and the source of endless life. This supports the core Christian view that Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God the Father and not just one of many ways to get there. So, my dear friends, as we end today's discussion, I want to give you a task. Have the courage to trust God with your money. Plant seeds of hope in your life and watch as God grows them and gives you a rich harvest. Additionally, remember that real wealth goes beyond just getting rich. It's a way to further God's kingdom and bless those around you. So let this be a call to action, telling you to step into a world of financial hope and enjoy all the good things that are waiting for you. Thank you for tuning in to Financial Stewardship Episode 5. We're here to support you on your journey towards financial freedom. If you found this video inspiring, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more information like this. See you in the next episodes. God bless you. From Elevate in Spirit.